Hi there, everybody. We're here today with Stephen C. Hummel. He is the Dark Skies Initiative Coordinator at the McDonald Observatory. Welcome to our podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. That's, we're so happy to have us here. <laughs> I have a little editing to do. <laughs> so happy to have you here with us today, Stephen. Can you tell us a little bit about your work at the observatory, please? Um, yeah, as the uh, Dark Skies Initiative Coordinator for the University of Texas McDonald Observatory, uh, my job is to protect the night sky, uh, which is a big task, right? Very, very vague. Um, but my job is essentially to preserve a naturally dark environment for the benefit of astronomical research, uh, as well as public enjoyment and education as well as for um, the benefit of wildlife and ecosystems that we have here in far west Texas. So um, I work with the surrounding communities in, uh, around the observatory, which uh, is near Fort Davis, Texas. Uh, I work with uh, other state parks, national parks. Um, I work with basically anyone I can talk to uh to to talk about outdoor lighting which isn't the the may not sound like the most interesting topic but that's really what what i do is i talk about lighting <laughs> i think that's super interesting i used to work with bats when i was a younger scientist and so not in specifically what i was doing but a lot of my colleagues were constantly thinking about light pollution with with bats and wind energy and there's a lot of dynamics i know at least just with bats i can only imagine all the topics you span it probably gets very complicated very quickly well before getting on this episode today uh it came to my attention that 80 percent of americans have never seen the milky way and I was just wondering how big of an issue night pollution, light pollution is in this, us not being able to see the Milky Way. And maybe you could touch on a little bit of, um, I think there's a seasonality to the Milky Way. And I don't know if that's true. I had heard that before. So maybe there's a bit of light pollution going on there, a bit of the seasonality thing, which people don't think about usually. Could you touch on that? Yeah. So um, yes, light pollution is is definitely the primary reason why most people haven't seen or appreciated the Milky Way. Um, but there are natural reasons as well, just to touch on that. Um, if the moon is up, if the moon is full, uh, even if the Milky Way is up too, if the moon's full, you're not going to see it. Uh, the moon is really bright. Um, a lot of people, when they come out here for the first time and they see the moon, they're, they remark that, oh, it's so much brighter out here. Uh, <laughs> Of course, the moon is exactly the same, regardless of where you, know, where you are. But um, yeah, it just seems so much brighter because the surroundings are so much darker than what most people are used to. Um, yeah, if you were planning a trip out to, say, the Big Bend region in Texas, where we are, to see the Milky Way, uh, the best time to do it is kind of late summer, early fall. At that time, the core, the brightest, most visually interesting part of the Milky Way is well positioned just after it gets dark. You can see the Milky Way at any time of year, but it may not be a convenient time in the night. So okay. for example, at this time of year, you have to wake up at like 5 a.m. Uh, <laughs> so if you're a morning person, that's great. But for most people, it's easiest in, in late fall. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> But, but yeah, obviously you have to go pretty far from a major city uh, to in order to appreciate the night sky. Um, and the Milky Way, you know, it, by astronomer's standards, it's pretty bright compared to the things we look at. You know, it's, it's very obvious. Uh, in fact, even uh, dung beetles use the Milky Way to navigate. Even dung beetles oh, can appreciate it. Um, that's they incredible. Are, yeah, they orient themselves along the Milky Way in the sky, it's believed they do that so that as they're sort of wandering around and the, and the Milky Way is moving in the sky, they don't bump into each other because when male dung beetles bump into each other, they compete for resources. They don't like each other. So it's actually a way of spacing them out, um, is the theory. So the Milky Way um, prevents dung beetle fighting in a way. <laughs> yeah, in a, in a way. Exactly. Um, surprising fact. Yeah. So, um, but obviously, you know, most people haven't seen it. Most people, um, if you've only seen photos, a lot of people, you know, think you have to have a telescope or you have to have special equipment to appreciate it. Um, the reality is it, it, it's pretty obvious when you're under a dark sky, but it won't appear in color. Um, our eye under dark conditions, it, it's what we call scotopic vision. I mean, scotopic is, or scotos is Greek for darkness. 
So when your, our eyes are totally dark adapted, we turn off our color receptors, but we're more sensitive to light. So if you if you look at like a, a moonlit scene, you know, where, where the moon is lighting something, if you look around, everything looks black and white. It's it's not because the things don't have color, right? The grass is green, the trees is green and stuff. It's so that our color receptors turn off. So when we look up at the stars at night, you, know, you see the really pretty, pretty, uh, beautiful pictures of the Milky Way and all these gorgeous colors. Those colors are real, but our eyes turn, to, turn those receptors off. Right. <laughs> so interesting. So that's where it might be useful to have a nice camera or something to capture those colors that your eyes are not detecting because the color receptors are not functioning or they're turned off in the darkness. That is yeah. so cool. That is super fascinating. <laughs> Did not know that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, oh, ahead, sorry. Yeah. Were you, no, go, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. You. So, um, yeah, obviously, like, you know, the Milky Way is something that has been a part of human history for, you know, forever until the last hundred years or so. You know, it, it's always sort of been there. It's only the last few decades, especially that people are growing up ne having never seen it. Um, in fact, I was just talking last night with uh, a professional astronomer, a theorist who the kind of person who sits behind, you know, computer most of the time. He's in his mid thirties and he had never seen the Milky Way until he came out here. And he, wow. he worked, he studied galaxies. That was his job. Right. Um, so, you know, light pollution is, is sort of robbing this sort of cultural touchstone that all of humanity uh, has shared until recently. Um, it's increasing at a rate of about 10% per year in North America. Wow. Uh, so for context, the rate of population growth in America is le consistently less than 1% over the past decade. So it's growing much, much faster than, you know, our cities are growing. Um, and so we're, you, in order to even begin to see the Milky Way these days, you have to drive at least 100 miles or more from a major city like Houston or Dallas. Uh, and there is nowhere left in Texas you can go, there's no place left. You can go and see a 100% natural sky. Even in the deepest, darkest parts of the state, there's still glow on the horizon from cities. So no place is left untouched anymore. Wow, even your observatory, no, even your even observatory, here. Even here. wow. It's not enough to affect research, but that's my job is to make sure it stays up that way. Right, interesting. So I've. I've got two follow-up questions. One's maybe a little off script, but so it sounds like light pollution is growing at a faster rate than actual population. So what can individuals do to help conserve the dark night skies and tagging onto that from a legislative perspective, because I'm guessing this is a lot of like city planning. Could you touch on that and how you're actually working with those, those groups to keep your area dark? Yeah, so um, you know the primary reason light pollution is growing so rapidly right now um, is just poor lighting practices and a lack of understanding, and which has particularly been exacerbated by LEDs. Mm -hmm. uh, the switch to LEDs has brought with it a whole host of environmental problems, uh, really unintended consequences. Um, but, but the basic idea is, you know, wh why it's increasing so fast is we are using more light that is white, light that mimics daylight. Okay. And when we look up at the sky in the daytime, the sky is blue, even though the sun isn't blue, right? The sun is a perfect, brilliant white. Um, and, but the blue colors of white, because white is a combination of all colors, scatters more in the atmosphere and that's why we can't see the stars in the daytime, and that's why the sky is blue. Blue scatters more. So by using lighting at night that mimics sunlight, really, the color and feeling of it, um, light pollution is growing rapidly because the blue component is so much greater than it was before. Um, so using a more amber color of light goes a long way. If we, if we eliminate the blue and just kind of use a more amber tone, or yellow, um, that solves a big part of the problem. Another really simple thing so everyone can do is just make sure your light is aimed down. You know, mm -hmm. the thing you're trying to see is the ground. Right. You know, you don't need to illuminate the sky for the bird's benefit, right? They're not they're not <laughs> gonna appreciate it. Um so yeah, aiming it down at the ground and shielding it such that no light 
is going directly into the sky uh, also goes a long way. Uh, and then only using the light that you need and the amount you need it, you know, like uh, over lighting doesn't necessarily make you see any better. Um, our eyes are always are constantly adjusting to whatever the ambient level of light is. So once you reach a certain threshold of like a minimum amount of light, adding more light does not increase visibility. In fact, at night, it decreases it. Because now if you have something really bright, you're adjusted for that and you can't see in the shadows. So it makes it means like, for like example- car, car with its brights on it's coming down, down the highway at you. Yeah. And then after can't you can't see anything. See anything. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what color are those th those lights these days? Bright Super white. Blue, white. <laughs> Bright white, yeah. And that's another reason why it's particularly so annoying. The, the blue color actually scatters more inside the eye and then creates more perceived glare than yellow does. Um, so it may be nice for the driver, but that's why I think everyone kind of <laughs> hates those new LED headlights yes. if they're the, yes. on the other end. Um, but yeah, if ever went to shielded lights, used an amber color and the intensity they needed and no more, and then just turned off the ones they don't need, then light pollution will be broadly solved. You know, um, light pollution is one of the few kinds of pollutions that you could solve immediately, right? Air pollution, even if we stopped emitting carbon dioxide, it's going to take years before we really reap the full benefit of that. Light pollution, it's immediate click of a switch, you can fix the problem. Right. That's an interesting way to put it. Cause I know there's a lot of problems out there that they're so daunting to solve. It's nice to have one that we actually have control over in our own homes, outside of our own homes. It's just like flipping a switch. Yeah. It's yes. just like flipping a switch. <laughs> so for those external lights, sorry, I just wanted to ask a follow-up. Um, when you're saying the amber lights for the folks at home, is that the warm the warm lighting that they advertise in, in, you know, in the stores, it's warm lighting versus the cool lighting. So warm lighting, do you have a suggestion for lumens that sort of yeah, yeah. Mi minimum? Yeah, the specifics, you know, um, look for what, yeah, what they call warm light and they give it a number. They measure the, uh, the, um, the color of light by the, what's called the color temperature. So you want 2,700 Kelvin or below. Okay. Uh, so, which looks more red. The higher the number, the more blue it is, because th that's how stars work. And, you know, the hot things are blue, mm -hmm. but they call it cool, just to make it extra confusing. <laughs> In case it wasn't back. clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you they call it, either you want warm colors or you want um, lo the lower Kelvin number, the better. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and, and in terms of the lumen output, you know, do get the low try the lowest you can find and just see if it works um you know i i've i found even a bulb of three or four hundred lumens you know on a porch light that's more than enough hmm. usually for residential purposes 800 lumens is is plenty for for what the typical person needs okay that's great information so it's uh it's super awesome to hear that texas parks and wildlife is kind of partnered with the dark skies project to help keep the stars at night big and bright deep in the heart of texas you know <laughs> i'm sorry we love puns on this show <laughs> but could you tell us a little bit about the future plans um beyond what is currently happening with the dark skies project and texas parks and wildlife what what, what the future holds yeah so you know i've been working with texas parks and wildlife i should say mcdonald observatory has been working with them for for over a decade now um and we're working on we're working on getting a number of state parks recognized as dark sky parks. So there's a certification process. It's very rigorous, it usually takes years to do fully. Um, that's by the International Dark Sky Association. So if you hear the term dark sky park, um, they don't just hand that title out. Um, that park has to go, that, that means all the lighting has to be, you know, dark sky friendly, you know, warm colors, appropriate intensities, et cetera. Um, they have to have some kind of outreach program about this topic uh, and a way to appreciate the night sky at that location. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. And we're working on a number of sites in the whole, whole country and West Texas and other areas, getting them up to, to speed. Um, and eventually, hopefully, the, the lighting standards that we've developed will become just the 
de facto lighting for all of Texas state parks. Um, but we were a long ways from that, uh, but we're getting there uh, quickly. So um, yeah, we're making some progress. So I'm excited about it. So um, specifically, you know, uh, you know, there are quite a few in the hill country. Um, like Enchanted Rock State Natural Area is a dark sky park. Um, but we're working on some others like um, uh, Lost Maples State Natural Area, uh, Waco Tanks uh, State Park in near El Paso, lots of places. You know. I, was, I was just about to ask you to give a few a shout out just from my own knowledge. So that's really great. I'm, I'm new to Texas. So just hearing where you can go and see the night sky is, you know, something that I think about often, but don't put enough effort into when I'm planning a trip. So knowing that some of these parks are certified just adds that extra level of, hey, cool, we, if we're up late, let's go have a look. Yeah. So uh, I understand you're quite an accomplished photographer. Uh, I actually, in doing some research on you, saw some of the work that you've done. And man, some of that stuff is like, it, I mean, your jaw just drops because it's like, I didn't even know this kind of uh, weather phenomenon or whatever you want to classify it as e even occurs or like this existed, you know, and you've got like this red pink lightning looking stuff coming. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. I, I'm sure you can describe exactly what it is. Could, <laughs> could you talk about some of your, your fo photography and maybe what your favorite photograph that you've ever taken is? Yeah. Um, for the listeners, um, to understand what he's, what he's talking about. If you, if you just Google really quickly, Red Sprite, Red Sprite, um, that's the the search term. Um, you'll, my image will probably be the, the first result, but um, the, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I, I do a lot of night photography. Uh, it's kind of how I got into astronomy really is, um, you know, I knew that there was so much that our eye couldn't always appreciate. Um, and, I, but with a camera, you can ex expose and see so much more uh, what's really out there. Um, not to say that the naked eye experience is disappointing. It's it still never gets old. But um, yeah, you can you can. It's a it's a new window into the universe is how I saw it. Um, so I discovered sprites. Um, you know, I heard about them online, read a few articles, and I was like, oh, that's that's probably super rare. I'll never. I don't, I don't really understand it. Um, but I was watching a thunderstorm here one night. And uh, in May, uh, a few years ago, and, you know, it was way off in the distance. You saw the flash flashes of lightning on the horizon, but it's not like there was any threat of rain. It was pretty far away. Um, and then way, way up high above the thunderstorm against the backdrop of the, you know, black starry sky, um, I saw these fleeting glimpses these of, of like columns and these sort of jellyfish looking things. Uh, and, um, and I thought I was imagining things. Um, so I set up a camera and I started just taking photos continually, just a few seconds, each one. And sure enough, I caught one of these things and it looks like these red tendrils. Um, and I knew then uh, enough to realize that what I caught was a sprite. Um, and sprites are um, rare, well, semi-rare, I would say, electrical discharges from thunderstorms. So when you have a really, really powerful cloud to ground lightning strike, the, the electric field above the thunderstorm can actually flip and cause an electric charge on the boundary of space way up high, almost altitude of Aurora to um, flow down to the lower atmosphere. And that will cause the nitrogen in the air to fluoresce red. Uh, so nitrogen glows red when it fluoresces, um, and uh, actually, if you look at aurora, uh, some of them also glow red. Or kind of the same chemical thing going on. So sprites are kind of like storm aurora, in a way. Oh. Um, they're very brief; they only last a few fractions of a second, um, and they only genuinely form from exceptionally powerful lightning from large developed thunderstorms. But of course, in Texas, uh, we've got plenty of those, uh, especially <laughs> April, May, June. You know, they're, they're those big, powerful thunderstorms sweep through um, in Austin and in San Antonio, hundreds of miles away from here. At McDonald Observatory, we're in the perfect place to observe that because uh, we can see above the thunderstorm. 
So um, they're really big structures. Like uh, the, my, my most famous image of the, the, the jellyfish sprite, as I call it, because it's kind of what it looks like. Um, that structure is a, over 30 miles across and 30 miles tall. So it's about the size of the Dallas-Fort Worth Nectarplex floating in the sky. Wow. So you don't want to be close to it, right? Because right. then you won't be able to appreciate it right. if it's right above you. You got to be far away. Right. That is fascinating. I, I am learning so much. I did not, I had never heard of sprites with sun, thunderstorms. And granted, I'd never really looked far off in the distance. I'm sort of always under it but that's incredible i'll have to search yeah. i haven't seen those images yet I'll have to search they're, they're, they're breathtaking Worth yeah, looking yeah 100 100 sure, like, wow well so we probably have a lot of folks hopefully a lot of folks listening that maybe haven't been into stargazing in the past or haven't done astrophotography for folks that are interested in in getting into this or, or sort of taking a leap into this, do you have any suggestions for programs or online groups to get their foot in the door and sort of hear the basics and they can run with it? Yeah. Um, you know, I got into astronomy when I was in college. I joined a um, an a amateur astronomical club in, when I was living in St. Louis. Uh, and most big cities have, a, you know, some kind of astronomical club or society. Uh, I know all the major cities in Texas do. Um, and basically, these are, you know, just average people gathering to talk about this topic. And they may be called amateurs, but some of them honestly know more about the night sky than some professionals. Uh, <laughs> I believe that. Talented people out there. Uh, and so I was very thankful for um, the St. Louis Astronomical Society um, for all the their expertise um, so yeah, I mean, if, if you're in a major city, look for that. Um, if you're, if you're not near a major city, I don't, I don't think there's an astronomical society near you. Um, you know, I, I, I there's great resources online, uh, you know, the forum, the most common forum people check out for this is called cloudynights.com because obviously when it's cloudy, you can't go outside and stargaze. So you just <laughs> post it on the internet. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I got, really started uh well even not not even with a telescope just with binoculars right even just binoculars allow you to see so much more uh, and they're really easy to use uh, and if you find out astronomy isn't your thing they're still useful for other things right right so, <laughs> yeah, uh, birding you know just scouting out a scene or whatever but uh, whereas a telescope it's generally only suitable for looking at the stars um astronomical telescopes you wouldn't really want to use them for observing things on the ground because they are mirror imaged so everything will be upside down or yeah. flip left and right so it's it's very disorienting um but yeah binoculars uh i also use an app called stellarium on my phone there are others like it like sky safari just to tell just to tell you where things are what's up that might be interesting to see um, so all those resources are great, easy ways to get started, uh, and kind of, you know, once you get the bug, then, you know, it'll snowball from there. That's great advice for folks interested in getting in on the ground level. I have, a, I used to live in, in, uh, Southern Australia and I saw the Aurora Australis for the first time and I really wanted to get into photography and of course I didn't but uh, it's now that I know about these resources maybe the time has come in Texas yep. <laughs> my time is here <laughs> well Stephen we've never had an astronomer on our program before so first of all we're learning a ton and it's been such a pleasure to have you but one of the things we like to ask is advice for younger folks in the science field um, as far as how they can progress their career and we wondered if you had any advice for the next generation of scientists interested in astronomy. Um, yeah, I, I'll say astronomy and the field of astronomical observations in general um, is is much broader than what you might expect. You know, um, uh, observatories don't just need astronomers; we need engineers, we need software developers, electricians, mechanical engineers, um, the people who develop, develop the instruments and maintain them, you know, all that's really important too. Um, so I, my background um, is some astronomy, but actually my degree was in international relations uh, and economics. And I kind of got into astronomy from the, you know, communications and talking about light pollution perspective rather than from studying stars, you know, in a pure sense. 
Um, so, and, and I think that's actually pretty common uh, in astronomy. A lot of people you find at observatories are not necessarily the astronomers. Um, they're, they are here, of course. Uh, there are PhD astronomers, but there are far more everything else that goes into supporting a facility like that. Um, so my advice is, you know, like if you're interested in astronomy, um, obviously math, science, you know, taking those classes in that field are very important. Um, but if you find out that maybe just learning about Wolf, Wolf Ray stars and the, you know, HR diagrams isn't your thing, there are other approaches to astronomy where you're still working in the field. Um, and actually those are probably in more demand. Uh, we only need so many astronomers who analyze data. Uh, we were always in demand for electricians and mechanical engineers to maintain the, the equipment we need. Yeah, I wasn't even thinking about the maintenance of the observatory, but that makes a ton of sense now that you laid it out there like that. It actually makes me think of, um, I'm sure you guys have seen the show, The Big Bang Theory. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a character on there that he is, he's an astronomer, uh, but he ends up working at the Griffith Observatory, but he's doing like educational outreach, talking to the crowds that are coming and like you were saying, that might not be a trait you would think of is something that's needed in the field, but it's so important to be able to convey topics and information to the public, you know? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. And it's a different skill set, you know? Yes. We, we, a lot of people, they think I'm a PhD astronomer, and I always remark, nothing against the PhD astronomers, but you don't always want them, you know, in, you know, <laughs> You know, especially an audience like K twelve. That's not all that you need. That's a the language is 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 slightly different. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's consistent across PhDs, yeah. like all across fields. Well, I struggle with that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh. So that's that's awesome advice. And on the same note, are there any opportunities for interested people or parties to volunteer to help directly with dark skies or maybe projects like it? Yeah. So um, I always will take any opportunity to plug the Texas Master Naturalist Program. Um, if you are interested in helping out your local parks uh, in Texas, the, that Master Naturalist Program is is excellent. Um, there are several different uh, chapters of the Master Naturalists that uh, get dark sky training on, the, on this exact topic. Um, so uh, that's that's one way of getting involved. Um, I, I'll say, I mean, the, the best way to help dark skies is to use good lighting practices at your own home or business. That, that's really where it starts. And then kind of be an example to, to others and, and spread the word. Um, it's not about you know, it's not about a dark ground. It's about a dark sky, as we like to say. It's not that we're not asking everyone to just turn off all the lights and live in darkness forever. Obviously, light has a purpose, um, but we want to make sure that we're only using light that has a purpose. Um, so another great organization is the International Dark Skies Association. Um, you can go to darksky.org and learn more about them. Um, they have efforts across the world to uh, help protect the night sky, a lot of educational resources. Um, and if you're interested in helping out in the Big Bend region of Texas, you can support uh, our efforts. You can go to um, mcdonaldobservatory.org and learn about uh, our efforts locally. Um, we, we're a pretty rural area, so uh, I don't know if we're, you're gonna get any listeners in our, you know, only a few thousand people that live in this area, but um, definitely appreciate local support as well. We'll have to link no, definitely. the we website. Can, we can link yeah. the description as well as the, the YouTube video. So, Stephen, you talked a little bit about your future plans to get some more parks, um, certified dark sky. Is there anything else that's coming up in the future with your dark skies initiative that you wanted to tell us about? Yeah, so um, it's not so much in the future as it is in the very recent past, but um, the McDonald Observatory, Texas Parks and Wildlife, the National Park Service, the Nature Conservancy, and CONAMP, which is the Mexican equivalent of the National Park Service, recently joined forces to create the largest area in the entire world where the night sky is protected. Uh, and this was certified about a year ago exactly, uh, almost to the day. Um, so uh, this is called the Greater Big Bend International Dark Sky Reserve. Uh, it took us over a decade of work to create 
Um, but it's the again the largest area in the world where the night sky is protected. So what that means is um, all of the uh, parks and all of the uh, counties and municipalities in the Big Bend region of Texas um, all have uh, light pollution ordinances essentially. So so it is law, uh, you know, requiring lights to be shielded, aimed down, uh, a certain color, you know, limiting the blue light content. Uh, the intent language on intensity and timing. So um, it, the, the role of those ordinances is mostly to raise awareness rather than strictly enforcing them. Um, but uh, still, it's it's a monumental um, achievement. Um, the total area is about 15,000 square miles. Wow. Um, so it's bigger than several US states, yeah. uh, bigger than Delaware or Rhode Island combined, I believe. Um, and it is also, uh, crosses the international border by incorporating lands uh, in Mexico on, on the opposite side of Rio Grande, opposite of Big Bend National Park. Oh, that's incredible. Um, so, yeah, so that was certified a year ago, and now what we're doing is just keeping up the momentum, you know, <laughs> trying to maintain it, make people aware of it, uh, you know, making sure that the, the next generation can keep it alive. Um, yeah. So that's that's where our efforts are focused right now. Well, congratulations. That sounds like it was a monumental effort. So I'm glad that your project came to fruition and that you're hitting the ground running, maintaining it. That's amazing. Super awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and it, across an international border, that's uh, even more impressive. Like that's very difficult incredible. to do. Yeah. 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 Um, so we have a signature. Uh, so we have a <laughs> signature question here, Stephen, that we love to ask everybody. And that's, can you share a biology blunder with us? Something that maybe out in the field, you know, it, it just didn't go as planned and you end up on your back or something funny. Generally. Thumbs in your fo photograph. Yeah, thumbs <laughs> in your photograph. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I travel around uh, our, our region of what, far west Texas to take data on basically me measuring the amount of light pollution that we have and make sure that, you know, we have, we're making progress on all that. So... I go out to all these remote locations, and of course, they're all totally dark in the middle of nowhere. Um, and but one of these locations I went to was on top of a little mountain nearby, um, and uh, you know I set up my my equipment, you know, several thousand dollars worth of gear, you know, setting it up in the dark, really, you know, trying to be really careful. Um, and then I start taking data, and while I'm taking data, I can't use a flashlight. I can't turn any lights on because that would interfere with the measurements I'm taking. So instead I have uh, night vision goggles, right? Um, and so I'm out there, I'm sitting out there. It's kind of boring when it's running. You just sort of sit and wait for the computer to do its thing. It takes about half an hour, 45 minutes. And I hear this rustling in the bushes uh, and it gets louder and louder. I hear this growling sound. Like, Rrr. I was like, oh, okay, what, what is this? You know, we do have bears in this area. So I was like, oh God, I hope it's not a bear, uh, you know, at night or mountain lion or something. And I'm looking around in my night vision and I just don't see anything. And like, I just, there's just nothing around. Um, and out of the, the tall grass comes hurtling at me, like running at me, a raccoon. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I guess it didn't even see me. I don't even think it knew I was there, but it just bolted and it went like rushed up against my leg and then just kept going. What? Just ran off. I was like, why is it in such a hurry? Like, I don't know to this day, like what it was, but it scared me to death. Like the fearsome trash panda. <laughs> right. Sometimes and more cautious course... than mountain lions. Yes. <laughs> right. And of course in the night vision, it's like, you, everything like its eyes are glowing and right. you know it's like a demon coming at you from the brush oh man that yeah. one moment where you just want to flip the switch on and be like i i need to know what's going on you know <laughs> right at least it wasn't a hurry past you not toward you at yeah you. into you yeah right, into, uh, yeah exactly. i have no idea why <laughs> i've never seen a raccoon run that hard um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> had place to go. Hopefully, <laughs> oh gosh, that is a, that's a good biology blunder. Yeah, that's that's one of my one. favorites so yeah. far. <laughs> I also have an affinity for raccoons. Me I think too. I like trash pandas. Right. They're cute when they're not <laughs> running at you. Yes. <laughs> well, this has been such an incredible chat with you, Stephen. Do you have anything else that you want to share with us and our listeners today? Any anything we might have missed that you just want to put a plug in for or thinks interesting? A parting note. 
Um, yeah, uh, April 18th through 22nd um, is International Dark Skies Week. Uh, it's an annual celebration of the night sky. Um, we've got a lot of stuff here at McDonald Observatory going on that week. Um, public tours, talks about um, dark skies, uh, its impact on wildlife and more. And of course, telescope viewing, um, lots of cool stuff going on. So you can check that out at mcdonaldobservatory.org under visit. If you're listening to this in April 2023, um, got lots of stuff coming up. And if you're listening to it, listening to this later, we do this every year. Usually, uh, whenever the new moon is in April, it's International Dark Skies Week. Um, so always be on lookout for fun stuff going on. Super cool. That sounds great. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've learned a ton. And thank you for our listeners. Just remember, everyone, don't feed the wildlife. <laughs>